and welcome to the second in a series of educational webinars hosted by RMC WISE. Today's topic is a really excellent one and one that's been requested many times and this is operational risk. We have with me, we have an absolutely brilliant selection of speakers. We have Kevin Polidano, a risk manager by profession and an independent board member. Sandra Saliba, an expert on ICT risk and cybersecurity at the Malta Financial Services Authority. Rihanna Mikallef, risk manager at AQA Capital. Nikki Elul, an operational resilience expert at the European Central Bank and James Farruja, legal advisor and regulatory expert at Ganado Advocates. James is participating in Paul Spalzonstead, who unfortunately today cannot be with us. So before we start the webinar and I hand over the floor to our speakers, I would just set this in for today's session. So the webinar will be for 75 minutes where in the first hour or so we shall be discussing the topic with our panelists and then we will leave the uh, last 15 to 20 minutes for questions. The recording of this webinar will be available on RMC website and uh, that, that is for you to uh, access and uh, please do ask any questions at the uh, end of this, of this webinar. So let's uh, start. And um, my first question, Sandra, is to you. I mean, the MFSA has put a lot of emphasis on risk management, both quantitative, but most importantly, qualitative risk, or better known as operational risk. So what is the MFSA currently focusing on when it comes to supervision of operational risk? Welcome, everyone, and uh, thank you, Chris, for your question. Um, yes, in simple terms, operational risk is any risk that does not uh, qualify as market or capital risks. Um, so to this end, the authority certainly oversees uh, different subsets of uh, operational risk as part of the on-site and off-site supervision. Um, using the Basel Committee methodology uh, for components of operational risk, as an example, um, for operational fraud, uh, for operational risk in terms of uh, internal fraud, uh, for instance, the authority would look at aspects like misappropriation of assets. Um, for in the area of, of products and business practices, the oversight would focus on market manipulation. And for instance, under the execution, delivery, and process management. Uh, the supervision would pertain to breaches in regulatory reporting or uh, data entry errors. Uh, of course, um, every sector of financial services has uh, regulatory provisions relating more or less explicitly to business continuity management. Um, and um, MFSA has focused on these aspects in relation to COVID measures taken uh, by license holders over the past year. Uh, there have been a number of um, supervisory uh, exercises conducted in this regard uh, across different functions uh, of the MFSA. Um, in addition, the, the authority places a great importance to the oversight of the outsourcing risk. Um, the outsourcing arrangements are assessed uh, on ex ante basis before the license holder enters into agreement with a third party provider, as well as during uh, on-site um, and off-site supervision. Uh, hence, yes, different uh, aspects of operational risk are looked into during um, desk-based reviews, thematic visits, or uh, full scope on-site inspections. Uh, when it comes to ICT and uh, cybersecurity risk specifically, a year ago, uh, the MFSA established the supervisory ICT risk and cybersecurity function as a cross-sectorial supervisory unit uh, responsible for the supervision of uh, ICT and cybersecurity risk management, as well as the oversight on risks associated to ICT outsourcing. And the function supports the uh, authorization teams um, by assessing applications from the ICT uh, perspective. We also conduct supervisory meetings, um, usually triggered 
uh, by notifications on um, of uh, operational and uh, security incidents as submitted by license holders. Um, we conduct assessments on uh, IT questionnaires under the SREP procedure, which is the supervisory uh, review and evaluation process for credit institutions uh, under the single supervisory mechanism. Um, and we conduct on-site inspections focused specifically on ICT and cybersecurity risk management. Um, over the past year, the, the on-site inspections focus mostly on uh, financial institutions and investment firms, but there is more to come and the on-site inspections will obviously continue um, this year and, and in the future. Uh, what's important, uh, and I would like to mention it now, is um, in due course, uh, the authority is also planning to conduct a desk-based review uh, in a form of uh, self-assessment questionnaire on ICT and cybersecurity uh, risk management, which will be addressed to all license holders falling under the remit of MFSA. So it's quite a large exercise and all sectors will be included in, in it. Um, finally, I, I think it's worth mentioning as well the guidance document on technology arrangements, ICT and uh, cybersecurity risk management and outsourcing arrangements, which was published in December last year and which sets the uh, MFSA's expectations in the area of ICT um, and cybersecurity risk and the digital operational resilience in broader sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra, for this intervention. So here it shows that good governance also is important in, uh, in an operational risk aspect. Uh, so linking this, uh, Rihanna, uh, what, what do you deem as good governance surrounding operational risk and uh, who should be involved in, in the process and also how would you report operational risk? Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Chris, for your question. Um, so basically, when you ask who, is, who should be involved in the process, it's basically everyone. So to achieve good government, governance, sorry, there must be good communication flow um, across all the company stakeholders, especially when it comes to the, 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 the decision-making process. So first and foremost, at the top, we would see the board of directors, right, and their role in establishing a framework um, and then setting the tone on the risk appetite that they want the company to have. So the risk that ultimately they are willing to take on. Um, we also see the most commonly uh, mentioned three lines of defense, which form uh, a key and essential part to having good governance um, when you speak about operational risk. So, uh, here again, you have the board. The board determines the risk appetite of the company, so much how much risk they are willing to take on. Um, but the appetite is not set in stone. It's not something which is um, static, and it can change over time. Because as we also have seen, um, even recently, um, we witnessed in the industry um, that a company might have suffered uh, major losses when it comes to operational risk such as, for example, cyber threats on their system. Um, so this might trigger a red flag to the board who might then want to rethink the amount of risk um, the, the company is actually taking on and you know, uh, lower it, for instance. So the board must, as I said, um, establish and approve a framework. However, they do delegate um, some of that responsibility to implement the framework um, to the company's senior management especially the risk manager, when it comes to setting uh, the required policies and procedures. So the risk management function, um, as I mentioned, part of three lines of defense, um, will, together with other senior managers of the company and skilled individuals, implement then that framework, uh, which has been set by the board. And this must be very much based on the day-to-day -day operations of the company. And here it's worth pointing out that many times there is um, a misconception that the risk manager's role is to manage the risk, but essentially it's the first line who must manage and control for the risk. While the risk manager is then there to um, support and advise and challenge the methods the risk is being managed by the frontliners. So 
this brings us then to the first line of defense and the, the, the business people, right? Um, so as, as I mentioned, they are the subject matter expert, experts who can provide full insight on the operations of a company and uh, the risk there is and how this can be managed through co relevant controls, for instance. So here, the role of all the employees will be that of being um, aware of their surroundings, aware of the operational threats that they see to the company, and also they will ultimately be risk and control owners. <clears throat> so taking as an example, as I said, um, I mentioned cyber threats. Um, it, the risk manager will not have the full knowledge on the IT infrastructure of a company. And it's just they must conduct meetings and be in continuous discussions with the experts um, of the company on IT, for example, um, who would be owning the risk and the controls. So from all of this, in summary, we see that you have it's a top down approach and it starts from the board. You, they set the risk appetite, they establish a framework. You have the first line of defense um, who manages the risk and the controls. You have the second line who will challenge um, the first line on the methods being applied and, uh, and used. And then also you have the third line, which is internal audit, um, which will act um, as a final layer, so to, so to speak, um, to mitigate any failures. Um, moving on to your question on reporting. Uh, there, is, there are various fronts on what a typical uh, operation risk report might include, um, but you always have to ask yourself uh, the question, what is the intended purpose of your reporting? Why are you doing this? And what is it that you want to um, bring, bring through? So this will then um, give you a good picture of what you want to report to, to your board. So if it's a full risk dashboard, it's all outlining or the risks or anything which has been assessed, which has been uh, new to the company, any red flags to keep an eye out, for instance, or any incidents which have actually occurred. And um, if the company also maybe makes use of key risk indicators as a quantitative measure for operational risk, it would be also a good idea to um, report on those so you can have a good balance between um, having reporting what the company is taking on as risk against what um, the risk appetite and tolerance is. Unfortunately, uh, we don't see many operation risks reported to the board, um, even during their quarterly uh, reporting. But uh, this, this kind of risk must be given the same kind of importance um, as all other risks ultimately. Thank you, Rihanna. So here uh, it shows that it is important that a risk management framework is in place and that there should be uh, the risk owners who must be determined uh, by the board of directors and the risk manager to, of course, report on these uh, risks and ultimately to mitigate these risks. Nick, uh, as an operational resilience expert, what would be the key elements to mitigate the risk of a business disruption? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to point out that I'm here today in a personal capacity, so the views that I will share with you are purely my own, and they are not necessarily those of the ECB. And after that disclosure, I can go directly to your question, Chris. Business disruptions should be treated like any other risk. So as Rihanna was saying, this implies that effective mitigation requires the adequate tone from the top, starting with clear policies and, policy and guidelines that establish the framework for identifying any potential business disruption and also creating the structures to handle these disruptions when they take place. The business impact analysis, the BIA, is the foundation of any business continuity process. The BIA basically assesses each and every process to determine its criticality or importance. This is done by determining the impact that a disruption in the process would have on stakeholders, which is usually represented in terms of business, financial, and reputational impacts. These impacts are determined for various time intervals. So we assume there has been a disruption and we assess the impacts after two hours, after four hours, 
after one day, two days, and so on. When any of those impacts reaches the organization's impact tolerance levels, which could be different from the risk tolerance levels, these are quite separate, that shows the time frame by which the process has to be up and running in some form or another. This is usually referred to as the maximum tolerable outage, the famous MTO. This is used everywhere in business continuity management, MTO. So for example, the MTO for trading would be something like two hours because you really need it up and running quickly. Whilst the MTO for updating your social media platform might be one day or two days, depending on how reliant you are on your social media platform. The next variable that you should determine is the MSL, the minimum service level, which establishes the bare minimum output required out of that process. This will vary a lot depending on the nature of the process. Let's say you publish certain statistics on a daily basis. The minimum service level could be that in case of a disruption, you publish only the key figures without having the usual splits that you tend to provide and without having any analysis of the data. But at least you have provided the key figures, so you have achieved your minimum service level. Then the next step is to develop robust and effective business continuity plans, BCPs. For, not, not for all your processes, but just for those processes that fall within the scope of your business continuity strategy. So basically your business continuity strategy will say, up to what MTO you want to capture and have BCPs for. You might decide to have business continuity plans only for those processes that have an MTO up to 24 hours. So for those processes that need to be up and running within a day. If you are more risk averse, you could decide to have business continuity process plans for processes with MTOs up to one week or two weeks. It really depends on the attitude of your organization and also on the kind of work that you are on, whether there are any regulations and so on. So with that, we have covered each process individually. However, over and above BCPs, you also need to implement a crisis management structure that allows you to rapidly handle and resolve any crisis, which goes beyond the individual BCPs. Things like fire in the premises or a ransomware attack that require additional considerations on top of the workarounds defined in the BCP. Ultimately, all of this needs to be tested because as they say in the military, no plan survives first contact. First contact. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't plan, but it means that you should plan and rehearse and rehearse and still be able to adapt because things that you didn't think of will happen and you need to be ready to adapt. Thank you, Nick. So risk management in, uh, in the financial industry is often outsourced. Kevin, from your experience, having uh, heard the intervention of Nick and, and Rihanna, is it uh, common practice to outsource uh, operational risk? And how would an entity uh, or how should an entity do? What should it do to minimize outsourcing risk? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Chris, for taking the time to actually organize once again this interesting webinar. So yes, outsourcing um, of operational risk, which would be part of risk management in general, is a very common practice on our shores. Um, obviously, these would incorporate um, not just the risk management, um, the broad risk management aspect, but there are other outsourced services, be it compliance, internal audit, or sometimes even portfolio management. I mean, that said, the risks posed by outsourcing these key functions may be somewhat undistinguishable from any other um, risks, um, may, may be minor, um, uh, offered through other key service providers. And um, we all know how painful it is when, let's say, the internet, your internet provider tells you that a cable has been mistakenly cut by the, by the developer next door. I mean, just to point out, I've got a construction site right next to me. So if you hear any background noises, I apologize in, in advance. 
Nonetheless, there are a number of sound practices and that should be um, in place when you're outsourcing uh, risk management, operational risk in, in particular. So you need to make sure that before you actually engage an, outsize, an outsourced service provider in OSP, you need to make sure that you have, uh, you've done your due diligence um, prior to the engagement. And obviously you need to also have in place an ongoing due diligence process so that you're actually as uh, during the assignment, during the engagement, you have an ongoing um, measurement of, of performance. You need to also make sure that there are no conflicts. So the OSP is actually acting on the best interest of the client. You need to have in place regulated um, and written procedures in line with the prevailing rules and regulations. You need to have the SLAs in place, your service level agreements, if need be, some key risk indicators and performance indica indicators upon which you can actually assess the level of the service that is being received by the OSP. You need to make sure that the OSP will adhere to client confidentiality and data protection, especially if you're sending out data to, to, your, to your OSP. You also need to make sure that you have termination and continuation um, policies in place and disaster recovery, like both Nick and um, Sandra and even Rihanna touched on. Um, and you need to periodically test these, um, these backup facilities. So this segues nicely in, into sort of the fact that you need to have full access to your OSP. So if you, may, if you need to make an on-site uh, visit to your, to your OSP, that obviously has to be something which is allowable. Um, with a, obviously, you need to advise them a few, hopefully a few days in advance, but that is definitely something that, um, that should be put in place. And we should also consider where possible a, a dual supplier strategy. So we're saying that in this case, we mentioned the internet services. It would be good to have a backup of, um, of internet providers or some, some internet dongles. Now, yes, risk management can be outsourced. Nonetheless, it is always the responsibility of the manager so, um, or the company who is actually outsourcing this risk. So the board, even if it is outsourcing the risk manager, it needs to retain the knowledge and the expertise to effectively monitor um, the outsourced service provider. Thank you, Kev. James, often business conduct and reputational risk are also linked with operational risk. What companies should uh, be aware of and also perhaps you can give us uh, some consideration on the communication with the external environment. Um, thanks, Chris, and thanks for inviting us on, on, on this webinar. Um, the first point that I wanted to make is that ultimately every organization, when, it, when you talk about business conduct, management of reputation and other risks, um, the first thing that we need to focus on, as Rihanna was, was saying in her intervention, is the governance structure and good governance within the organization. The right internal controls in the first line, the properly resourced second line functions, and an overlay uh, of the third line function overseeing, I mean, the whole organization in a more holistic manner. So I think, I think good governance is the first step in, in, in achieving that. The second, the second consideration is in fact, if you look at the MFSA rules, it's one of the first provisions in, in every rule book, is the need to act honestly, fairly, and in the best interest of your customers, right? So obviously all businesses are, are in the market to make money, but um, the, I mean, the, pro, the, the profit um, element of it should not come at the expense of the quality of the service that is provided to the, to the end customer. So they need to have good governance coupled with the principle, with, with the core principle that we need to act honestly, fairly, and in the best interest of investors are key. 
Other equally important considerations are having a clear compliance culture with, within the organization, right? So making sure that there is a sense of ensuring that we do things properly, we have the right controls, we follow the parameters that, that uh, the MFSA has, has imposed uh, upon us, we follow good market practice, and we are customer-centric, essentially, I am making sure that we are meeting the needs of the customer and following the various um, requirements, not necessarily regulatory, but even linked to best market practice, which might go even beyond the minimum sort of regulatory requirements in making sure that the service that we are providing to the client is in line with the customer's, with the customer's expectations. Another key consideration is making sure that we recruit the right people for the right roles. Um, we should never go, we should never hire someone to check the box and say, okay, we have a risk manager, done. We have a compliance officer, done. Right, we have an IT, an IT manager, done. We need to make sure that the people we recruit, especially the individuals um, dealing with, with customers are of the right, have the right skills, are being trained or mentored, and that as far as we are concerned, the selection process of these candidates is adequate, detailed, and we identify people with the right skills for the right roles. Um, in, we have come unfortunately across situations where um, operators need, for instance, a risk manager and they just hire one, right? Or they, need, they, they decide to outsource risk management and they go for the cheaper, cheaper option rather than for the better option, right? Uh, maybe because the better option is a few thousand euros more expensive. So uh, same thing for compliance. So we need to make sure that we have, get the right people um, for the right for the right loans. Knowing that not putting, I mean, the resources in the right places, we would end at the end of the day, risk, right? Paying, paying for, to fund an FSA or a FIAU penalties rather than, to train and make sure that we have the right resources in the right, in the right places, right? So as far as we are concerned, we need to make sure that in so far as, I also have a, a construction site next door, so bear with me and apologize for, for that. So as far as, as, far as, as, as all this is concerned, having the right resources is incredibly, incredibly important. Disclosure requirements to investors Right, and essentially treating customers fairly and providing the right disclosures, the right explanations. Now, this varies depending on the business model. It's, it's one thing if you are a retail wealth management uh, outfit, it's another if you're a fund management business, it's another if you are purely an online executing broker. So obviously the different business models come with different um, needs and different ways of interacting with the, with, with the customer. But the, keeping this and following the principle of we need to provide adequate disclosures, adequate explanations to the customers, not terms and conditions which are 700 pages long, font six, which no one reads, right? Especially when we deal with retail customers and in, in a face-to-face -face context, um, in the wealth management business and so on and so forth, taking the time to explain things to our customers, it's all about it's all about acting um, in a transparent and clear and honest way with our, with, with our customers. So ranging from the core principle that we need to act honestly, fairly, and the best interest of investors, strong compliance culture, strong governance framework within the organization, having the right people in the right, in the right places, treating our customers the way they deserve to be treated rather than simply seeing how much money we are going to make out of them. So I think all these variables put together, if applied correctly, will result in the business being run smoothly, in customers being happy with a limitation when it comes, I mean, a, a material reduction in reputation and risk, which predominantly would come from customers complaining and taking us to the arbiter, or regulatory breaches, which are published on the website of the MFSA, or sanctions from the FIAU, which are published on the website of the FIAU. And so, and then caught by, I mean, the current media frenzy, that as soon as someone slips and gets fined five euros, you see his name on the Times of Water or on another, or on another sort of local newspaper. 
so again, as far as as far as we are concerned, making sure we have the right all these right systems and processes in place will result in, in good business conduct, good practices, uh, good internal practices, and uh, the, the proper management of of um, something we hold very dear to our heart, which is which is our reputation. Thank you, James. So, from your intervention, it's clear that uh, governance documentation is is key in in this regard. And uh, Rihanna, earlier you touched upon operational risk framework, which is also, uh, let's say, a document important uh, in terms of of governance. But what is operational risk essentially? What, what does it in, entail? And uh, does it um, include how operational risk must be uh, measured? So uh, thank you, Chris, for that question. I will try to keep it as brief as possible because, um, as even Sandra mentioned, operational risk ultimately covers almost every kind of risk, excluding the financial ones. Um, but a good starting point would be, I guess, the ISO on risk management, right? The International Organization for Standardization. Um, they put out a good number of key processes which are required to have um, a good risk management structure, not essentially operational risk, but a good uh, risk management structure. And uh, these processes are still um, very much relevant to the operational risk framework. So as I also tackled in my previous question, um, you need to con continuously communicate with your stakeholders. You need to see what their expectations are. So again, three lines of defense and the board. Um, you, together with them, you need to discuss on the scope. So where are we now, but where do we want to be when it comes to operational risk? Um, this will help in identifying and uh, uh, seeing what risks you might encounter to get to where you want to be as a company and to mitigate your operational risk. So. You're, you've identified your risks um, using a standardized approach, such as, for instance, the bowtie principle, which I will touch base upon even later on. Um, and then you have to analyze and evaluate your risks. You, you cannot just, I, because sometimes uh, risks are identified, but a company might fail to take action on them. So it's to have a robust operation risk framework, it, it has to be a full picture. You cannot stop at identifying or analyzing the risk. Um, but you have to treat the risk. And again, here we see uh, various um, common practices used to treat a risk, which also I will briefly touch upon. And apart from that, um, you need to continuously monitor and review your risks. It's not that you have assessed one risk one time and that's it. You need to Operation risk, it's, it's more of a, um, a journey, it's not a destination. You need to continuously monitor what's going on around you and what's happening in your company. And again, I can't stress enough the importance of reporting um, because ultimately it's, it's not, it's, nothing is closed. You need to open up on what the company's most, um, most important risks are in this regard. So as I said, I mentioned the bowtie approach, which is, um, I, I think it's an industry standard to identify risks. It's very forward looking, sorry. And as the name implies, it's um, a bowtie diagram, essentially having clear separation of your preventive and reactive sides to any of your risks. Um, but in order to be able to apply your bowtie, uh, you need to first establish the things. And that is um, deciding on your objectives, as I said, so deciding where you want to be um, when it comes to operational risk, and also discussing what are your critical processes that you need to do right to get to those objectives. So once you identify those two, you can easily get to a number of risks which will stop you from achieving your objectives. So um, to, to get in the train of thought, let's take an example, right? Um, current, a very current one, COVID. Um, so here our ob objective is to stay safe and to stay healthy. And the critical process is that one needs to do to keep that objective is to social distance, wear a mask, um, sanitize regularly. So the risk essentially here that will stop you from achieving your objective of staying healthy is getting infected. So once you have identified that risk, um, you must then ask yourself, but um, how can that risk occur? 
And this will take you to, to identify the root causes that may cause the risk in your company. And uh, ultimately, uh, it will take you to assess what controls you need to put in place to prevent that risk from happening. Um, again, keeping the same example of COVID, root causes. So how can I get infected, right? You, you might touch an infected surface. You might be in close contact with someone who is positive, for instance. Um, so you have the risk, you ident you've identified the causes. So then you need to establish what the consequences are and the impact if that risk materializes. Because of course you might have many controls in place, but it still doesn't stop from a risk from happening. So keeping on to our example of COVID, if you do get infected, for instance, um, your impacts and consequences will be that you will, will, feel, you will feel unwell, right? And you might be overcome by stress or anxiety having to quarantine. So you would have the both eye, which is the risk, the root causes, the consequences, but then you need to establish controls. You need to control. Um, so if those causes have to happen, you have something to cushion against. And some of the controls um, which we see in this example, right, for COVID would be, again, washing your hands, um, social distancing, sanitizing. Um, but as I said, sometimes it's not even enough. And you, you will see that the risk will still materialize. So you would then need to have in place also some reactive controls, again, to push in the, a bit the impact. Um, so you might want to, I don't know, in the case of COVID again, seek some medical support or um, self-isolate for instance. So ultimately um, the framework is built around having a bow tie approach for instance, and which will help you brainstorm on how to go about analyzing your risk. And even though I mentioned controls, preventive, reactive controls, um, there are other ways that you can that a company might decide to treat a risk. Um, I mentioned earlier the the risk appetite that the company sets in. So if it's if the risk is already within the accepted level of the risk appetite of the company, you can accept the risk as is without maybe um, implementing further controls. You might want to avoid the risk and simply stop doing the activity that's causing your risk. Um, you might want to re-engineer the way, the way the risk is, so change a bit the company strategy or the objectives, just so you change the way the, the risk is structured. And there are other methods which are less commonly used, um, but they're still there to treat the risk. And these would include, for example, you um, decide to uh, accept the risk outside of your appetite because you know it might be too costly to um, set up the controls required uh, to safeguard against this risk or you know um, it will take you too much time to get to the desired level or even that um, the costs incurred in setting up the controls required uh, for this risk will be too much um, when compared to for instance if you had to suffer any losses in relation to this risk so there are many different ways to treat your risks. However, if we, if we want to um, stick to our bow tie approach, let's say, and treat the risk through setting up uh, controls, then, <clears throat> sorry, then you would have to revert to using your internal uh, risk and control assessment. Um, and this involves necessarily having uh, three stages. So you assess your risk from an inherent point of view, um, you review your controls and assess them and um, arriving ultimately at your residual risk. So uh, starting from the first stage, the inherent stage here, you are assessing your risk um, to maybe scenario analysis um, and uh, you identify those um, risks which have large impacts, however, small probabilities of occurring, but however, may be very catastrophic to your company. So you need to assess the likelihood of that event occurring as well as um, what the impact will be on your company. Um, likelihood is very subjective and it will depend on one's idea of the event occurring. However, having said that, um, your likelihood can also be based on historical events. So again, keeping on the example of cyber threats, for instance, 
um, if you know that your company already suffered some cyber um, threats, then you will re be able to assess your likelihood from a different perspective. And then you move on to assess your impact. So how will this risk impact your customers? How will the risk impact the company's reputation, as James mentioned? Um, what's the financial impact? Maybe you have reimbursement costs and regulatory fines. Um, so ultimately, it's bringing about all that together, impacts likelihood, so you can arrive at a risk level which you are comfortable with. Once um, you take into consideration the inherent risk which you have, which excludes any kind of controls, then you must move on to assess your controls, see what controls you have in place, see if they are effective, if they are working as they should be, if they need improvement. Um, if you do not have some certain control and you want to introduce them. So ultimately, when you assess your control framework, your internal control fr framework, you need to arrive at a residual risk, um, which is taking into consideration the same scenario, but this time you will reassess your impacts and likelihood when taking into consideration the already existing controls you have in place. And one thing, one very important thing to note here is that when you have um, controls which are not working as they should be and they're deficient sort of, there should be an action plan in place. It's not just leaving it there. It's, um, you need to have an issue and action plan. You have to have an action owner who will review this risk, this control, and will move it forward to close any gaps. So I believe following this train of thought and asking all of these questions will get you to have quite a robust operational risk framework. Thank you, Rihanna. So it is clear it is difficult to, to of course, quantify and come up with, with a metric um, when, when it comes to operation risk. Um, we are receiving a lot of questions. I will leave these questions um, uh, for the end of the of the webinar, those 15 minutes, as, as I said before. Um, uh, I turn to you now, Sandra. I mean, uh, you specialize on ICT and security risk, which, uh, in my opinion, are a subset of uh, operational risk. So what are the do's and don'ts that, let's say, that um, uh, entities should pay attention to? Thank you, Chris. It's, it's great to hear so many interesting comments. And I definitely agree with, uh, with Rihanna and with uh, Kevin on the uh, points, both on outsourcing and the role of uh, the board and three lines of defense. So I will try to structure the do and don'ts around these comments. Uh, certainly, uh, the ICT is a subset of um, operational risk um, needs to be controlled uh, by the board. And I like to say that the ICT risk needs to move from basement full of techies to boardrooms. Uh, and the boards should uh, set the, the right top down approach um, in relation to the manner uh, in which the, the operational uh, resilience is achieved by the company. Uh, so don't, let's start from what the companies shouldn't do. Um, don't omit operational risk, especially if you are uh, the risk manager or the compliance officer. Uh, a number of sectors have now uh, regulatory requirements for the information security function, which is the second line of defense for, let's say, ICT and cybersecurity risk. Um, within the company. It's a control function which is expected to oversee uh, the actions taken by the, the ICT team responsible for the day-to-day -day operations in the area of ICT. Um, and as a control function, this function is uh, expected to ensure that the ICT strategy uh, is in line with the overall business strategy of a company, or for instance, that ICT outsourcing is in line with uh, outsourcing policy or for instance, that adequate uh, policies and procedures have been implemented um, in the area of security monitoring. Very often this second line uh, of defense would be performed by risk or compliance or a dedicated function. Um, and, and this is critical uh, for credit institutions, uh, investment firms, and so on it will be as well for insurance undertakings. Um, another don't, um, maybe I will touch upon something that James referred with, with the reputational risk. 
um, don't think that you are too small to fail. Certainly, uh, the principle of proportionality should apply and the guidance document refers to it as well, but having basic controls in place is a must to achieve the cybersecurity hygiene. And for the, the smaller entities, uh, which do not have sophisticated systems, which don't go for a cyber insurance, um, that, that don't uh, have a, a great um, number of uh, expertise in terms of staff that is employed in-house or, uh, or, or uh, based on outsourcing, um, an incident, a severe incident, may result in significant uh, financial or data losses or losses to intellectual property, for instance, or reputational damage, as James have mentioned, which will be so severe that it will be impossible to, to recover from. Uh, on the other hand, don't think you are too big to fail. <laughs> and uh, don't forget that intra-group outsourcing, it's still like outsourcing. I completely agree with what Kevin said on, on outsourcing. Um, this also applies to intra-group intra outsourcing. If you operate on a group-wide ICT infrastructure, or if you outsource uh, your ICT systems development to another entity within a large group, you may still have vulnerabilities at your end. And if an incident happens, the board of the local entity will be responsible uh, and, and uh, will not be able to shift the responsibility to, to a group um, a group entity. Unfortunately, we, we see that intra-group outsourcing is sometimes uh, omitted in, in the area of uh, outsourcing controls. Now do's maybe. To, to, to not go so negative, do have positive, uh, do have um, uh, proper uh, policies and procedures, as Rihanna has mentioned. No matter what product you offer or which channel you use to communicate with your uh, customers or third parties, if you have uh, proper policies and procedures, you are a step closer to, to the right controls and, and better security posture. For instance, if you if you are subject to um, incident and you have proper incident management procedure in place, um, you can ensure that the roles and uh, responsibilities are allocated to the right employees in a timely manner. And you can definitely respond uh, to an incident much faster than if you have to allocate ad hoc uh, responsibilities because there are no procedures outlining them. Um, another advice, so to say, or rather what is now uh, an area that we supervise and we check during on-site inspections do compile a comprehensive ICT asset inventory. If you um, don't have a proper asset register, it's very difficult to allocate risks that may affect each and every asset. And when I speak about asset inventory, it's important to include the hardware um, that, that we would normally think of uh, as, as ICT assets, but also other intangible assets like software or even functions that fall under the ICT umbrella within a company. Uh, the risk relating to key personnel is very significant. It's also part of operational risk. If it's not outlined in your uh, IT assets inventory, um, you may not adequately mitigate the risk of losing the key person in the ICT department. Uh, finally, do uh, what you should do. Um, Brianna has mentioned three lines of defense. Do include ICT audit uh, into the agenda of your internal audit. The third line is very important um, to the company. It helps the company to identify shortcomings in a timely manner. And if they are rectified um, in, uh, fast enough, it can help um, the, the companies to sustain um, major threats and keep a strong cybersecurity or ICT risk management posture. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. So from your intervention, it is clear that a business continuity plan is a must-have document. Uh, Nick, from your experience, how would you go about in structuring a business continuity plan? It's a very practical question, Chris. We, we get asked this question quite often, especially by those embarking on a new business continuity management cycle. So there are no hard and fast rules for designing a business continuity plan because there is no one size fits all solution. 
In your organization, you will have several BCPs. Basically, one for each of your processes that follow it in your scope, like I explained before. The detail level of each BCP should be commensurate to the importance of the underlying process. So the BCP for trading, if trading is really important for you, should be really detailed to ensure that it does not grind to a halt. But your business continuity plan for updating your social media platform can be just a few lines, or you could have no BCP at all. It depends. Now, there are various ways of going about designing a BCP. In my opinion, the best way is to use an impact-based approach, as it is an easier concept to work with than the scenario-based approach. So with an impact-based approach, you start by identifying the critical resources for achieving the objective of that process, human, IT, and premises, and identify the bare minimum of each that you require to achieve your minimum service level within the maximum tolerable outage. Now, in plain words, that is to achieve the most basic outcome that you can live with made available within a time frame that does not result in excessive damage to the organization. Following that, the next step is to find alternative solutions or workarounds for these critical resources. So let's look at the three of them. With human resources, you're looking at special skills. So let's take the trading example one more time. As a bare minimum, you need two traders, but you know that in your organization, you have six traders, which means that you're reasonably covered. Unless, of course, these six individuals are living in the same apartment and they all end up quarantined because of COVID. It might sound funny, but you really have to think of everything. Think outside of the box. Now, IT systems, there are various IT systems, but as an example, you can think of Bloomberg and DViews. And you could have alternatives such as Reuters and MATLAB. So that's a really basic alternative, just another IT system. But in some instances, you could even opt for rather manual workarounds or have some Excel file with inbuilt macros that you have stored somewhere, which you resort to in case of emergency. Another very important IT aspect to look at, and usually everyone needs this, is access to their network, typically to extract data. So look at what data your process needs and think about saving that data on an encrypted USB each and every evening, such that if something happens, you have it available the next morning. But make sure that the USB is encrypted, is kept somewhere safe and somewhere accessible. It's useless if Chris takes it home with him and the next day when we have a disruption, Chris is in Hawaii. You don't have access to the USB. So keep everything in mind. When it comes to premises, it's typically quite simple. You just look at how many workstations you need. So let's say that for trading, we need a minimum of two workstations. And we have to find an alternative in case we can't gain access to our premises. A rather simple solution could be that you collude with another organization where you agree that in case where you have a disruption, you will use some dedicated workspaces in their premises and vice versa. And now with COVID, it has become really clear and obvious that working remotely is a very feasible option. So you could have no alternative. The alternative would just be that you work remotely from anywhere. Of course, all this depends on the regulations that you are subject to and also on your internal policy. You might not be allowed to work at the premises of a competitor or you might not be allowed to connect to a public Wi-Fi. So of course you would never go to do your trading or to do any confidential thing in a McDonald's Wi-Fi because that is not secure. So when trying to find alternative solutions, try not to create unnecessary risks as you go along. Of course, there's other information that you could include in your business continuity plan. Things like contact details. This might sound obvious, everyone knows who they need to contact, but in times of stress, it's really handy to have them written down on your business continuity plan, especially if the process is being done by alternate staff who are not so used to the process. So for them, it would be really helpful to have the contact details listed there. And as another helpful thing is to include any links to websites that you use regularly. And it's not it's not uncommon to see entire manuals being attached to a BCP. 
it's not that you're going to go through the entire manual during a disruption, but maybe you need to find something specific. So you refer to the manual and you have it quickly there rather than having to waste time looking for the manual and then to find that item within the manual. And the last thing that you need to think about is how to make this business continuity plans available. It's useless having the best business continuity plan if you can't gain access to it during a disruption. Typically, you would have them as a soft copy on your network, as a soft copy on an encrypted USB, maybe the same USB where you keep your backup data on your work phone, or printed and stored in secure locations. Most organizations tend to opt for a mixture of these. And then again, as I said in my first intervention, you need to test and test and test. A BCP that has been written with all good intentions. If it hasn't been tested, you don't know whether it's going to work or not. So test it, make sure that your testing is challenging, but realistic. And start slowly and increase the intensity of you as you go along. Test one or two aspects from the BC, from one BCP. And as you go along, start testing more aspects from the same BCP. Start testing BCPs jointly and also move from Announced test, I would really suggest that you start with announced test. Otherwise, it might be a big failure. And gradually move to an announced test only when you feel that you have reached the right level. I mean, the subject is really, really deep and it, I could keep going and going on about how a BCP look like, but this should give a good idea of the main features that you should have in a BCP. Thanks, Chris. Very good, Nick. Really useful insights into structuring a business continuity plan. Uh, Sandra and, and James earlier on mentioned uh, governance. And um, uh, there are quite a lot of challenges uh, to, to board and senior management. Kevin, from your experience as a board member, what would be the main challenges for uh, the board in steering the company through, through a crisis, like for example, uh, the COVID-19 has, uh, has shown. Oh, yes, I was a mood there. So yes, indeed, um, during times of crisis, obviously um, the board and the senior manager, they need to work very closely together. Obviously the management will have the day-to-day -day, um, duties to actually navigate through the storm, and the board would need to make sure that we're actually heading um, in the right direction. Um, for those of you who are IMA members, there's a very good um, due diligence um, operational resilience, specifically on, on, on COVID, which obviously can be tweaked as well to, to any other crisis. Um, however, in terms of um, what we need to make sure as a board, I think it's a very valid point that um, Rihanna mentioned in her intervention is that we need to ensure first and foremost, the health and safety of our employees and their families as, as an, a natural extension. Then um, you also have your customers and suppliers and basically the community within, within which we operate. The board needs to make sure as well that it stays informed. Now, I know it's common practice that boards or committees meet usually once, once a quarter. However, during times of crisis, you might actually um, set more regular meetings. Now, what would you discuss? What would be the information that you'd ask for during these meetings? I mean, there are a number of key risk areas, in particular um, financial resources. Maybe you'd start asking for monthly management accounts, updated budgets, um, stress tests in terms of revenues and margin compressions. Um, so these are things um, that you, as a board member or a committee member, you would ask for um, on a more regular basis. Again, something that has been more than adequately covered by um, Sandra and even um, Nick. Now, is the technology risk? You would have to ask the right questions in terms of cybersecurity and remote working. Communication strategy. You need to have an effective communication strategy that emanates from the board um, top down in, in terms of how clear and honest and thoughtful the communication is with all stakeholders. 
I mean, you need to try and strike a balance as well at the end of the day between the immediate crisis, but also at the same time, look at the long-term strategy. As a very smart chap once said, in the midst of every crisis, there lies a great opportunity. Finally, we should take stock of what we learned. Um, how did we fare? You know, the pitfalls and what we could do differently um, in the future. I mean, hopefully the outcome of this assessment won't just be that, you know, during, if we had to face another COVID crisis, I mean, we would have to buy more toilet paper. So it would be something a bit more um, value added, so to speak. Thank you, Kev. I mean, we're running uh, out of time here. So, um, uh, James, before moving on to um, uh, to answer the, the questions, um, with this ever-changing, let's say, landscape uh, from an operational perspective, legal perspective, etc., how can entities ensure that they will be meeting their legal compliance and regulatory obligations from a risk management point of view? Uh, obviously, the first thing that we need to keep in mind is that we need to make sure that we are familiar with, with our regulatory obligations. So, I mean, having a very, a very strong compliance uh, function is, 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 obviously, is obviously key. Um, not only that, but uh, the risk management team should also be very familiar with the, with the regulatory requirements around the type of risks that they have to uh, oversee and also what is the regulator's expectation in so far as, as, as risk is concerned. Um, as Sandra was saying, and as we have all seen, there has been a, an extensive focus of the MFSA over the past, I would say, 18 months when it comes to cybersecurity risk, for instance. So that is evidently an area which is, um, I mean, very close to MFSA's heart and is an area which MFSA is expected to focus on, as Sandra has confirmed, and, and even more so over the, coming, over the coming months. So having a proper, I mean, compliance function with an adequate compliance monitoring plan, remaining abreast of regulatory developments as they, as they unfold, and making sure that uh, the first time functions are totally abreast of these regulatory of these regulatory developments, they are briefed um, and advised if necessary by, by, by the compliance function and that these regulatory developments are reflected in new or revised internal processes and, uh, and controls. So as far as, as all these matters are concerned, we cannot forget that we need very strong governance and very strong governance within the organization, and, and in particular, a strong compliance culture being, being uh, pushed down from, from, from senior management. So overall, uh, when, it comes, when it comes to these methods, it is literally um, making sure that uh, all the moving parts within the organization are doing what they are, are meant to be doing. And so far as, I mean, the first time functions are concerned, the second line functions are concerned and so on and so forth. Uh, regulatory requirements are, are always a moving target, right? So it is, uh, once, you, once we had with, with the Twitter IFMD, what, eight years ago, um, everyone had to adapt and deal with it and, and change. Then you had MIFID too, everyone had to deal with it, adapt and change. When this year we have a lot of changes. We have SFDR coming in in a, in a couple of, uh, next month, actually, we have AI we have the AI FMB2. We also have the six cent money laundering directive. We have the investment firms directive and the investment firms regulations. So we have a lot of uh, requirements. I mean, coming in and and adapting ourselves to the, to, to, to the ever changing regulatory landscape is what what will uh, keep a regulated entity um, afloat and operating in line with the in line with its requirements. Needless to say that as far as, as every regulated entity is concerned, maintaining an open um, communication line with the MFSA is, 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 is crucial for the simple reason that we need to do things properly, but we need to make sure that the regulator is comfortable and in agreement with us that we are in fact doing a sort of things properly. So making sure that 
we, we do engage with the MFSA when necessary, and, and we do keep them updated on developments, enhancements we are making to the organization. Not necessarily so much because it is a regulatory requirement, but more so because we feel that having an open relationship with the regulator is really is really the, the way to the way to go um, as far as as far as we are concerned. So uh, at, at the heart of it is adapting to is adapting to change, right? And whether it's COVID and where we had to all shift uh, to working from home where a lot of entities had to buy laptops because obviously a number of their employees perhaps had desktops rather than laptops. Uh, most of us, or well, some of us had to perhaps uh, do a makeshift office at home or in, in, in definitely testing, as Nick was saying, a business, the business continuity arrangements within, within the organization, having to deal with, with cybersecurity risks even more so, given that we are all sort of connecting remotely from 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 home so really it is it is ultimately adapting to adapting to change and and uh, whether it's regulatory changes i mean environmental changes or other other changes within within the organization uh, as far as we are concerned having a resilient business which can easily adapt to change is what will ultimately emerge the as the winning entity uh, at the end of the day, but always keeping in mind the core, the core principles: proper governance, a strong compliance culture, customer-centric practices, and for regulated entities, always um, uh, maintaining an open and honest uh, relationship with your regulator, which which I think is is a must. And I will leave you at that. Very good. Thank you, James, and. All, all the others for their uh, useful uh, interventions. Um, we, we have received a number of, of questions, uh, which I will try uh, to, to summarize because there are many um, which, which overlap. And then um, if there will be any additional uh, questions, we, we can take these uh, offline. Uh, so the first question is, how would a risk manager begin, begin the process of testing the controls to ensure there is efficiency in managing risk for the company? And if they are not efficient enough to bring down the risk to an acceptable level, what would be the next step? Do we revert to some form of insurance or we do transfer this completely by removing that line of business or product? Who would like to, to take this question from the panel? I can take it on, Chris, and maybe, I don't know, Kevin can provide his insight from also being a risk manager. Um, but essentially, the process is, as I, as I previously mentioned, you need to have good communication discussions with um, the first line. So you need to identify the controls. So we start from there. And then once you have a good picture of what the controls are, you can easily test them out. So um, I don't know, let's take, for instance, an IT risk uh, control, changing your password on a regular basis, you know, to avoid anything um, internal or, or, or something like that. So you can check if the logs of when the password was changed, for instance, and you test it out if um, it's being done on an automated basis, for instance. So you need to start from the controls. You have the controls and you test out that they are working. Um, again, if the company is doing any penetration testing, for example, there would be a log, there would be um, a report which outlines this. So it's, it's very subjective, but you will have an idea on what you, you will see it when you get to the list of controls on what you need to test. And when it comes to the second part of the question, if it's not enough, if the controls are not enough to bring it down to the um, level which is expected, then you either have to um, create more controls. And if this may be too costly because you're a small firm, for instance, yes, you might have to revert to transferring your risk um, either to risk sharing, um, insurance, or, or completely yes, to avoid the risk, removing that product or that line of business that's creating the risk, which is outside of your acceptance level. Thank you. Chris. Yes. 
if I may add something. Um, I mean, what 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 Rihanna said is obviously extremely valid. Um, maybe something that can actually come in handy. I know that the title of this webinar is actually um, you know operational risk behind quantifiable risk, but there are ways and means how you can actually try and quantify um, the operational risk. So there's sort of the preemptive measures where you try to assess the, a probability, you assign a probability to the specific risk. I mean, it ranks between highly likely and unlikely. And then the impact on the organization if that risk had to materialize. So sort of post the post the event, so to speak. And you actually come up with a with a risk scoring, which can be a very interesting document that you can present to your board. And then from then, from I mean, you actually have a number and um, something a bit more tangible to actually discuss with your board. Thank you. Um, uh, I think it's it's which uh, mostly relates to, to what you just uh, said, Kev, is how often should a risk manager review those higher risks identified in the risk identification process? What consideration should be taken here in terms of the review frequency? So if, uh, was it Nick who wanted to make an intervention just before I tackle that question? Uh, sorry, Nick, I didn't, didn't realize. No, no, no issue with that, Chris. What I wanted to say is also that there's this social aspect to risk management. So whether if you want to know whether your controls are working or not, you need to be seen as a risk manager not as that annoying person who comes to stop the business, but that as that person or as that business area, because sometimes risk management is not just one person, it's an office who is there to help. And when you manage to create that sort of interaction with the other business areas, it's very likely that business areas will approach you voluntarily and say, listen, we're not sure whether this control works or not, because they are the ones who know what's happening. So I really try to push in creating this social interaction with the other business areas. Okay. All right, Chris, so shall I take on the, what was it, yes, on please. three risk indicators, right? Yes. I mean, there are, in terms of key risk indicators, there are numerous key risk indicators within sort of the operational risk framework. I mean, trading and execution, which is extremely vast. I mean, it starts off by the gathering of the data and that goes into sort of the investment process, making sure that the data that you're collecting um, is not co um, corrupted, it's accurate, it's, it, it has not been derived by insider trading or market or for the purpose of market manipulation. And I mean, it's, it's extremely fast. It goes into counterparty risk and business conduct and reputation and risk. I mean, I am more than happy, um, even if the person, the attendee who actually asked that question would want to get in touch with us, we can actually help him out and direct him um, even on certain documentation that can be used um, to first and foremost dissect um, into uh, all the detail required to identify these areas. And then eventually um, you should start building the processes around these um, key risk areas on how you actually identify them, mitigate and basically tackle these, these, these KRIs. Thank you, thank you, Kev. Um, I have a question here on asset management. Perhaps Rihanna, you can take uh, this. Focusing on the asset management industry, especially those small managers, managing operation risk can be a bit challenging when noting the number of employees and their current processes. H how should one go about in implementing an enterprise risk management framework for these small managers? And what is expected at board level here, taking into consideration the size of the manager? Um, so yes. It is challenging to set up a framework from scratch, but there are many guidelines. And as I mentioned, there is the ISO and risk management, which will help you set it up. Um, there, must, there must be a sense of awareness. Um, it's, it's not just 
coming one day and setting up a framework. Because I said, you have to, the train of thought is asking yourself a lot of questions because operation risk is very subjective. Um, and even though the number of employees might be low, you still might have an equal number of operational risks just as much as a large entity. You still have business continuity issues. You still have IT issues. So most probably you, you end up having actually more risks because um, you might have outsourcing when other entities might not have. So yes, what is expected at board level? Um, setting the tone, um, seeing what appetite you want you want to take on, um, seeing if you can tolerate any losses, any any losses at all in relation to operational risk, and always communicating it top down. Um, it's it's with the help of all the three lines of defense you can arrive at, at ultimately having a good framework. Thank you. So here we have the last three questions. Um, James, perhaps I can direct this to you. Um, at which point does the company need to employ a risk or compliance manager? What kind of advice would you give? That, that's, a, that's a million dollar question. It really depends on, on, on various considerations. First of all, it depends on the nature of the business. You know, again, it is one thing if you are running um, a retail brokerage slash wealth management business. It's another thing if you are um, a fund management uh, outfit with a lot of assets under management, but uh, maybe one fund only, right? Under management, which is not very actively traded. So uh, from, a risk, from a portfolio risk management point of view, so the person who is behind the screen looking at the numbers, which is pretty much um, sort of uh, something sort of within the sense of looking at the market all the time, analyzing the risks of the portfolio and, and, and so on and so forth. If, if you are a fund manager and you have a fair amount of mandates and you are running an actively traded portfolio, then you may need a risk manager in a relatively short um, when you relatively uh, short period of time from, from the launch of the business, obviously, as it's under management permitting. If, again, if you are running, uh, if you are a useless fund manager rather than an AIFM, where you have a lot of detailed, I mean, investment limits and so on and so forth, then perhaps having a risk manager who can dedicate considerable amount of time to the fund management company is again a must. It's difficult to say within three months, within six months, within, within a year. Uh, it is difficult to say because it, it really boils down to frequency of trading, number of mandates, uh, strategy to be followed, and, 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 and so on and so forth. From a portfolio risk, from a portfolio risk, risk management point of view. When it comes to um, operational risk management, so looking much more at the intended risks of the organization, then it again depends on the nature and, and the size of the organization. If you are an, an online broker uh, with thousands and thousands of retail clients, then obviously you probably need an army of, of, of intended risk managers to assess all the various risks, which Nikki and Sandra were, um, and Rihanna were, were, were highlighting, right? So in that particular context, you need them from day one. If on the other hand, again, looking at a fund management business, very passively run, in, in that particular case, probably you wouldn't need a full-time doing operational risk management, um, certainly not at the outset, probably not even after a couple of years. Uh, so on the compliance side, um, it's, a different, it's a different question because on, on the compliance side, if you are dealing with retail clients and you plan to have a fair amount of retail clients, I would say that you need a compliance officer fairly quickly from licensing, right? So fairly quickly from licensing because dealing with retail clients brings with it a lot of regulatory um, obligations and you need to have a properly calibrated compliance monitoring plan and resources available to run with it, right? If on the other hand, you are, as again, a fund manager, uh, an agent, for instance, um, then again, 
probably an outsourced function works well to the extent that the size is and the number of mandates is, is, is tiny. As the, 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 the company grows, as the mandates become um, bigger in terms of, of the number of, of different mandates, then at that stage, one needs to start thinking of, of insourcing or bringing it back in house um, as a function. But unfortunately, there isn't a hard, a hard enough or, or a fast rule which pretty much tells you six months, nine months, or whatever. It really depends. But I always tell sort of clients do a capacity plan, right? So ask yourself, I mean, you do the numeric exercise. How many hours do I need in a year on a, on a, from someone to do a good job on operational risk management, on portfolio risk management, on compliance? And if you're hitting the 1,000 hours, the, the 800, 1,000 hours a, a year, that's when you need a full time. Right, because a full timer is going to give you between 1,200 and 1,300 productive hours a year. Um, so, as soon as you hit the 800 hours, you need to start thinking of recruiting someone uh, if you were to tell me uh, on a full time basis. I mean. Thank you, James. Uh, the last two questions here uh, What would you consider a proactive approach to risk management? Specifically, what actions would you consider to be less reactive and more? Proactive. I would guess, Sam, if I had to um, point out the, the, the more proactive approach is that, as we continuously mentioned, all of us, um, all the three lines of defense have to take on the role. So if you're, if you're working frontline, day to day on the operations of the company and you identify new operational risks, it's best to speak up so you can start by assessing those new risks. Um, it's not just you see something happening and you just leave it there. Um, this won't impact the company. It, it might be a very low probability risk, but if, if it had to happen, it might have a large impact. So from that point of view, I would say be less reactive and take on a more proactive um, risk approach. Okay, uh, anyone wish to add? I mean, I have just one thing to add. If the risk manager, if you're the risk manager of a fund manager and you consider yourself to be a better risk manager than your portfolio manager or your CIO, then you're not in a very good situation. Because, I mean, the best risk manager in any fund management company should ideally be the first line of defense, the CIO, the portfolio manager, in terms of market risk. Then, obviously, when it comes to the other sort of uh, more um, qualitative risks that we've covered in, uh, in our session today, obviously, then the risk manager together with the CEO or the COO and the compliance because it's, I mean, operational risk is so vast. It covers so many different key functions that you'd need to have the input from, from many different um, sector segments of, of, of the business. Sandra, you are going to? Yes, uh, for ICT and cybersecurity risk, there is this famous five, there are the famous five steps, which is identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So when you speak about the proactive aspect, these are the first four and try to not have the need to respond. So for the cybersecurity, try to ensure that you identify, you protect, you detect. If there is um, an incident, an incident, you respond and you have a little need to recover from an incident. So the proactive uh, approach would be that you have controls in place which are so strong that the likelihood of an incident it's minimal and you are able to respond as soon as possible. So the recovery time um, is, is as short as possible. Thank you. So here we have the last question. What approach should a company take to ensure the risk appetite and risk tolerance are understood enterprise wide? I would go with awareness. You need to 
train um, everyone in the company um, to be aware of what the company can tolerate and uh, mostly it's training and awareness across all. Uh, I would go a step, a step before that. Make sure you have one, right? So make sure you do have and document your risk appetite, right? Because you believe it or not, uh, everyone talks about it, but no one put, I mean, put, puts it on a piece of paper, if I can, if I can say that. So, I think the first thing to do is to figure it out. I mean, have a, a broad discussion at board level and look at the risks associated with, with the business and set out, a, a, I mean, a risk tolerance level which allows the business to develop the way it should be. But at the same time, we always rein in if we are going in a direction which generates more risk than we are willing to tolerate. So, I mean, that, that is the first thing that must be, that, that must be assessed, documented. Then, obviously, I'm not talking about large organizations, which obviously would be much more sophisticated on this front, but small to medium-sized entities are still expected to carry out this exercise, right? The second thing that we need to keep in mind, is, as Rihanna was saying, is making sure that everyone knows about them, right? And, and not so much, obviously, the risk manager would know, but it is very much important that the guys in the first line know about it, because they are the ones which are seeing risk in their in their face, right? So they are they are the ones who are seeing the risk as on, a, on a day to day basis because they are the ones running the show. And if there are risks which are being um, which we are seeing and which uh, are not being managed properly, then escalation and proper corrective action is, is obviously um, the next step to um, to follow in order to make sure that we remain within our our risk tolerance level by perhaps putting additional mitigating measures. Very good, thank you, James. So this question here brings our webinar to, to an end. I believe it was a really useful and insightful uh, webinar uh, to our attendees today. And uh, I again thank uh, our, our panelists here. And um, uh, again, uh, I repeat that the, re the recording of this webinar will be available on our website. Thanks, thanks everyone and have an afternoon.